Let's do a little experiment. I'm going to throw this ball to you, and then you throw it back to me. And I will throw it to this tree. Let's go. How do you feel? What happened inside you when I stopped throwing the ball to you and I was only throwing it to the tree? Did you feel a little stress? A little bit of tension? The feeling that you just witnessed was an avoidance mechanism. It came by via the release of a stress hormone called cortisol inside you. And what it was telling you? That there's something wrong with what is happening. You should avoid it. And of course, what you should avoid is being excluded. Let's just step back and think for a second what happened here. I was throwing an imaginary ball to you and then to this imaginary tree. And your mind conjured up a community of you, the imaginary tree, me, throwing an imaginary ball via a screen. It was enough to give you the slightest cue that there is going to be a community here. And it triggered this negative feeling in you, which it would have done for every other member of our species. Because we are a community building ape. We create communities at the merest suggestion that it is possible to do so. And then we instantly belong, or not. When I'm hungry, it is my body's way of telling me that I need to eat something. So if then I'm going to munch on some honey, it is going to feel great. It is full of energy, it's full of micronutrients, even natural anti-inflammatory drugs. My body will tell me, look, eat more of this, it's good for you. Sometimes that message is about avoiding something. So if I'm up in the canopy of a tree, I'm going to be holding on for dear life, because I'm afraid of heights, which makes me less likely to fall and hence less likely to die. So this inherited guidance is often not about physical situations, but social situations. So when my friends come around and we cook together, eat together, drink together, chat together, sing together, all of this feels great. And of course, that means that I should be doing more of this, because I'm a community living ape, just like you are. But the flip side of this is that stress that you experienced when we played that exclusion game with the ball. It makes you being afraid of being excluded. In this sense, being community is like the honey, and exclusion is like falling from the highest of the heights. And that you are sharing with every other human being. You didn't learn this. You inherited it from your evolutionary past. You share it with every other human being. Now, we could have done this experiment in the New Guinea highlands, in Bolivia, in the Namibian deserts, and everybody would have responded exactly the same way. Because we live our lives, all the 70, 80 years of it, if you're lucky, in the intensive presence of others. 
we are dependent of other human beings. So it becomes our family, our village, our neighborhood, our town or city, our nation or society, our global society. We were born to belong. Belonging is so core to being a human being that when we exclude others, when we deny them the possibility to belong, we rob them of their humanity. My friend Mira Awad, singer, songwriter, has been exploring the issues around belonging and exclusion for decades. What up? How are you? I'm reinventing myself, like, completely. How? <laughs> there are no concerts, no events, <laughs> no talks, no nothing. Uh, so I took these two, three months to try and see what it is I want to be when I'm older. So what are you going to be when you grow up? I started directing an acting school in the desert. Small bunch of people, 18 kids. So the fact that you're in the desert, does it change yeah. the way people yes. approach acting? Yeah, it changes people, period. People have a different time feeling in the desert. You have much more time. It's crazy. People there, they have less need to check this all the time. So their eyes are with you. So these young people who, who choose to come there to study acting, for example, are much, much more present in the room than people are studying acting in Tel Aviv. The social perspective of people changes in the desert. It can be also in the forest. When I go north, where my parents live, and it's more of a green environment, you appreciate trees that have been there for longer than you can ever think of being there, right? And it makes you feel smaller in a way. It makes you feel more humble. Our reliance on other humans around us changes when we are in these environments. It's true. It's awesome. We are a species that has gone through almost extinct in the wild because our natural state yeah. is the forager hunter gatherer state. When, when we are living like that, we are really surrounded by nature and protected by our group. So of course we are focusing on that group. And the second we move into this crazy cramped environment, there are almost as if we lost a way of which group to focus on, yeah? Because there's like, they need to do that group or that group or that group or that group. But when you're in the desert or in the forest, when you're alone, you really feel you are against the elements. I'm a very individual person, right? I mean, I seem to be, right? I have my own opinions, my own way of life, my own definitions of things. But it's an illusion, you know, that we, don't, that we are so individual that we don't need others or we don't need uh, the elements of the social connectivity. So it gives you that illusion that you're on your own and you're against the world and it's fine. If it's business-wise, if it's emotional-wise, if it's whatever. So you're like in the city and you're like fighting this fight for yourself, right? When I want to spend time with my friends, we take ourselves and we go out of the city. We go and spend two days in the desert. The city gives you this illusion. Yeah, it's an illusion. We do need other people, and we feel safer when we have other people. Individualism, especially in an urban, high-density setting, is a coping strategy. That's how we can belong to many groups. That we say, well, I'm just myself, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you, all of these groups. But I, you know, I'm, I'm myself. A coping mechanism because we don't really belong, maybe, to anything. Maybe the feeling of isolation brings out this justification of, yeah, but anyway, I don't want to belong to anything, right? I left my village behind. I left all the norms that I was raised upon and, 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 and carried on to a different world in order to search for my own people. When I say my own people, they don't come from my religion, nor from my village, nor from my geographical uh, uh, location. They come from a, a similar state of mind. And yet, I believe it is some sort of an illusion. I needed to feel that I'm an individual, that I am that I can exist apart from everything social. And I needed that in order to go out and fulfill myself. I needed to convince myself that it's possible without a pact, that it is possible without a tribe, that it is possible without family even, because even my own family had trouble with me at some point. There were years when my own family did not back me up. 
So I really needed to convince myself in any way possible how to go on and how life makes sense without that fact. If I step back and, you know, I look at you as a behavioral scientist and what you just have said. <laughs> because Scientifically talking we, we, about We this. are apes, yeah? Yes, so If we I are. look at, you know, one ape talking to another other, other ape right now yeah. via ape technology and, you know, ape language. It's a very interesting mix what you just have said because at one, in one way you said, you know, I wanted to do my own thing. I wanted to be myself. But at the same time, you said, I wanted to find my own group. It's but a contrast I, so much. Yeah. I would have loved if my family and, and, and the people in my village would have accepted me. Because I would have wanted their support. I still want their support. It will never go away. I want my father to be proud of me. I want my neighbors uh, growing up to be proud of who I became, right? I need that acceptance. Why? So it, why? Yeah. Because we're built like that. We're apes and we are social animals. I feel no matter what I did with my life and where I, I, where I um, reached with my life and with my, with my success and with my achievement, I want the people I grew up with to say that I'm great. They are the most important. They will always be the most important. People that were with me in the class, right? The people that I went to kindergarten with. I want to meet them in the street and to be hugged by them. They are the most important for me. Now, I've gone out of there saying, yeah, I don't care what they say about me, right? Well, all right. Of course I do. Of course I do. But I had to invent this mechanism of coping, of, 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 of not being depressed and not being lonely and not being isolated and, and somehow, somehow going on and, and finding these things that I'm talking Now, I'm saying these are very private thoughts, right? These are things that I don't think I shared so much like it. Because I went there and went out there, and for a lot of my peers, I am like a, a story of success, right? I, I came from uh, a patriarchal village, a woman who's fighting for women's rights to, to express themselves. I go into the, because uh, I come from a Palestinian village, right, in, in the north of Israel, and then I leave my Palestinian village and I go into the general Israeli population thinking that, right, as a woman, nobody's going to judge me, whatever. And then I find out, find out that I'm a different kind of minority, I'm an Arab. I'm a Palestinian within the Jewish state. So again, I'm not belonging. Again, I'm different. And again, I need mechanisms in order to, you know, keep doing my thing and keep keep going and keep keeping optimistic about reaching some kind of my own community at some point. Because I could not find it for a long time. And I have to say that, it, yes, it's an emotional thing. It's, I needed that emotional wrapping around myself. In we are super special species. And one of our specialties is that we constantly talk about how very special we are. Every human language has a term that is going to separate humans from the other animals. But of course, we are animals as well. And we are products of evolution as well. We carry with us a host of tools and tricks but if you look at my measles body, you wouldn't necessarily know that. I mean, I work out a little, but my muscles are nothing compared to a similarly sized animal that is trying to survive in the wild. I mean, look at my teeth. They're good to eat apples and carrots and cooked food. If I try to survive by catching my food with these or defending myself against a leopard, I would be dead very, very soon. So we are slow and we are weak. But there's one organ in us that helps us deal with social life. It is this giant computing machine inside our skull. Our large brain helps us calculate the intricacies of the social life in a complicated social environment. But it is not only an organ that evolution gave us, but also a host of behaviors. And perhaps the most important of these is our need to belong. Very often when people describe their belonging to a group, it is in contradiction to another group. Mm. That and sometimes we feel stronger belonging to our group or one particular group against another group. But the way you described it, it was much more like 
you are belonging first and then came the realization that there's also an opposition to other yes. groups. Yes, I, I, for, well, in my personal experience, there is the belonging because it's dictated, right? You are born to a certain family, to a certain place, geographically, religiously, whatever. I did not use, I did not choose Christianity, but I was baptized, right? So I was like thrown in this thing. Already when I was 12, I did not want to cross my face when I go to a wedding in the church, right? So that was like, and I stopped. And even my mom, who is not a religious person, she would say, Mira, cross your face. You know, people are watching. I'm like, really? They care if I do this, you know, this physical sign on my face or not? They really care so much. So that there started to be contradictions between what I was thinking and what was imposed on me from society. But with it did not come the feeling that, yeah, I think I'm right. No, it came a lot of shame came a lot of shame and, and self-blame. Like, why am I, why am I, like, why do I have to be so different? Like, why can't I just do everything like everybody else and just belong, right? Why am I making this difficult for them, for me? And a lot of shame came with that, especially being a woman in a patriarchal society, right? Everything is about shame. Everything. Every move, every move you make, every word you say is about shaming you because you're doing it in the wrong way or you're laughing too much. I actually got that so many times in my life that I laugh too much. Can you imagine a girl getting a comment like that? Like, what do you mean I laugh too much? I laugh as much as I laugh. <laughs> How can I be judged for something like that? It's just funny because I know you, you laugh all the time. A lot. <laughs> yeah, I think it is all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the way you said it, put it on my face. Mm -hmm. Yes? So, it's, it's marking yourself. Wow, and, yeah. And, and you said, I, I was expected to put a marker on my face and I refused to do it. We thought we were, you were one of us and now you're questioning what we have you know, identified as the common ground? You tell me as a scientist that you haven't faced that. Of course you have. In science, which is supposedly about truth, the truth is socially constructed, yeah? So we have this scientific method. The whole point of the scientific method is that confronting our truths with the reality out there. And, and of course, it's true in the long run. But in the short run, is that if a group of science, scientists grows large enough that you can't maintain it with gossip and you know, scientific gossip, it splits into two. Yeah. This is how different schools emerge, yeah? And then suddenly you've got two truths. And then often they start worrying with each other, but you need to show, as you know, you need to show the, the markers that you belong to this group or that group, yeah. that people are going to be policing it. Uh, and, and, and if you're one of those who keeps saying, guys, you're, you're, you're right and you're right, there's a compromise in between, then you're a third group of this guy who's trying to, to bridge the peace, you know? And you're also looked upon as something different. It's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's us. This is how we're built. You know, when you describe this multiple, multi-group approach and this individualism, you're always in between. I'm identical. I think maybe this is why we're friends, yeah? Because there's, <laughs> there's this group of people who are basically these free-moving elements. Social nomads. And we are suspect by everybody. Yeah, we cannot, be, we cannot be trusted. To be gossiped about behind your back and to know that people are gossiping about you, this is the most hurtful thing you feel. I still feel my skin prickle, you know, when I think about that feeling as a little girl, feeling that people are talking about me, not nice things. In their imagination, it's not nice for me. <laughs> you know, for miscues, what is for miscues? <laughs> but for them, it was nasty, filthy stuff. And, and, and that... Of course it hurts, of course. Although I didn't believe that it was filthy or nasty, whatever I was doing. But the idea of them thinking about it as filthy and nasty and looking at me in a filthy and nasty kind of way, that was horrible. It was like slime, you know, crawling all over you. It's, it's, a, it's a very, 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 very hard experience to be within a community that that rejects you or thinks badly of you, and you know it, you always know it. Living for us humans means living in a society. I woke up this morning in a house that had been built by other humans. I had my morning coffee that 
was domesticated by others, planted by others, harvested by others, carried across the planet by others. All our needs are coming from the society around us. There's only very little that we actually do for ourselves as individuals. And this is why it is so important for us to belong. It is an inherited behavior, a drive that you were born with and I was born with. All humans carry it with them. We are truly belonging machines. And that means that when we are given a small cue that we are part of a community, we immediately jump on it. This is how movies work and books work. We are signaled that here is a community you are part of and we immediately enter and we start computing the details and the dynamics of the mini society we just dropped into. And of course, it is not only in the cinema and in a novel where this works, it is not only in stories that are being told to us, but in real life as well. After all, it is for the real life, for real communities and real societies for which this behavior evolved in the first place. So you belong to a lot of different communities. You were born in an Arabic, a Palestinian village inside Israel. You're a woman in a patriarchal setting. You are a rebel in a in a in a in part of the world where the tradition is to belonging strongly a group and not rebelling it. You are at the same time Christian and the Palestinian identity and Arabic identity. I identify, identify as Christian anyway. I'm sorry. You, you you are of Christian background. Right. And to top of this, you're also part Bulgarian. Yes. Can you belong to these many groups at the same time? Maybe you can not belong to any group at the same time. There are two kinds of people. One is very preoccupied in zeroing in on identity. What I mean is like zeroing in, finding the specifically specific detail of the group that they belong with and they stick there and they stick hard and, and they defend it crazily. So, so for example, it's not enough that I'm Palestinian, so I'm a Palestinian from the gallery. So I'm a Palestinian from the gallery, Christian, not Muslim. So I'm Christian, but I'm a Greek Orthodox, not Catholic, okay? So I'm talking about zeroing in as much as you can and then belonging to that little group as much as you can. On the other hand, there are other people, I, I think I belong to the other people, where they expand their identity as they grow. So I started out as a Palestinian girl in a Palestinian village, but then I grew out of the village and I became an Israeli, right? I'm an Israeli, Palestinian woman. And then I started meeting people from the world, and so I became a global citizen. And then first time I, I met a gay person, Right? The first time I came, met a gay person, it was like uh, weird to me. And then when I started talking to these people, I was like, they're struggling the same like me. It's the same. So their identity also got, you know, I, I also included that in my, in my identity because I know I identify so much with the same struggles, with the struggle to be yourself. So instead of zeroing in, I find that I keep growing. My identity keeps growing and including more and more things. If you know, I'm a public figure, so there's people feel very comfortable to demand things from public figures. So are you Palestinian or are you Israeli, right? Palestinians want to hear that you're Palestinian, the Israeli want to hear that you're Israeli, and there's nothing in between. And if you tell them I'm both, they go like, yeah, it yeah, cannot happen. I don't have a problem <laughs> with all these corners of my identity that somehow coexist. Sometimes they contradict, and then I need to... And then I need to figure out how they go back, how they go together. It's very interesting the way you said that these two different kind of people, because it's the same ape. So we somehow automatically put people in categories. Yeah. And apart from very rare cases when there's some kind of genetic underpinning for not having empathy, but that's very rare. Other than that, it's the same ape. So how is it possible that the the same behavior, the same drives, 
of people coming from the same village, the same household often, end up with somebody like you, like me, who like to travel among different groups and like to explore it, like we're almost like explorers of different groups. And there are other people who are really focusing on a single group, a single identity, behavior markers, physiological markers, a small set of markers becomes the focus. So I wonder what is the difference? What drives the same ape to go one direction as opposed to to go to the other direction? A lot of people who are in fringe groups, who, who are labeled extremists, were vulnerable kids, who needed to belong somewhere. The culture told them that to belong means hating others. And really, they want to belong. This policeman who killed um, George Floyd. Yeah. Um, I watched this awful video several times. You know, and yes. I, tried to, this, I, I was trying to force myself to distance myself from my emotions and, and, and watch it as a behavioral scientist. And, 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 and what, what I found is that he was, it, it was almost a performative act. It was a performative act of lynching. Um, but he needed an audience for this performative act. So he needed, he had to have his, his bodies to see what he, do, he does, no? So, okay, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm just too understanding. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 it's very interesting. Go on, I'm also, crying. I'm also crying because it was so hard for me to see that execution front of my eyes. It was just, it raised so many things about how we human beings, when we have the slightest justification or the slightest um, organization that justifies or whatever, the slightest one, we can go blind for so many things. So easy for us to do it. And I don't exclude myself. I am just aware that it doesn't happen to me. I don't expose myself because we're built like that. Just the slightest justification and the slightest uh, pat on the back from a boss or from a friend to say, yeah, you were right to say that to that bitch, you know? The slightest, the slightest community that would pep up the behavior can cause us to do the most awful things in the world, starting with Floyd and ending with the Holocaust. If there's something that scares me, it's that. And because I know it's in me as well, because it's a DNA thing, because we're built like that. And I made myself overly aware of where I get my justifications from. When we are excluded from a group that we thought we belonged, we feel pain. You can just think back to your teenage years when your friends had gone to a party or a sports event without you and you were at home alone and you were thinking, what happened? And you felt that pain and the fear that is going to happen again. For some of us, this turned into a daily occasion. And we were thinking back and asking, is it because of the glasses we are wearing or because we are a bit overweight or we are from the wrong nationality or because we are of the color. And when that happens all the time, it builds up, it accumulates. So it is not only one painful event in your past, but it is a continuous presence. It changes you and changes your behavior. In a way, it is a scar that lasts. I think the global society should be an equal one for many reasons, among them that that's the only way we can take responsibility for the planet. But how do we achieve that? We start from this scattered, broken up social world. How can we build it into a less scattered one? How, what is the way of 
of changing. Because it's not right now, the job is not to maintain an equality. The, right now, the job is to, to generate an equality, generate a bridge, a set of bridges. If we could find the answer, this would solve my my search that I have been doing all my life because all everything that I do is quite dedicated to that. And all the art that I make, every article I've ever written in my life, a TV series that I wrote, every song I've composed, every ceramic piece that I've made with my own hands, all of it talks about this and, and searches for the way of how do we reach people's souls and show them that this is wrong and that we have another option where we can be more in solidarity and more in empathy. And if we can solve it in this Zoom conversation, I'll be a very, very happy person. Those of us who, who come from in between points open up and create a larger group, which requires an act of inclusion. And it seems to me that a lot of your music and your art is creating that inclusion. So when you come to L London and you play your music, you sing in a synagogue and you tell the story, your story, in a synagogue, that's a performative act of inclusion. I'm really lucky that I have the media of music. It, it goes somewhere deeper and kind of bypasses all the, um, the antagonism that might have happened if this was, if the same idea was suggested on a panel. I do panels and lectures and I do music and there's something about the vibe of music in a room that just opens people up. There's a song that I wrote called Yaba, Yaba is father. Uh, and uh, it's, just, it's a song about some sort of a conversation between me and my father who is, you know, Palestinian, who was born he, he, in the same village that where I was born, only when it was Palestine in 36, right? And then I was born in 75 when it was Israel. So he actually lived through the what he felt as an occupation, what to, for in his reality it was, it was an occupation. They were actually expelled from their village, had to run away. Later on, they found a way to come back. Luckily, they found the house. They found the village still standing because other villages were destroyed. So they were the lucky ones who could actually come back, could actually go back to their land and to their houses. Others became refugees, whatever. And, uh, and I tell this story about my, my father being expelled from, their, from his village in 48. This is one of the most sensitive narratives for an Israeli to hear. For an Israeli, if you say 48 and the expulsion of Palestinian, it means that for them, right? It means that you are questioning the legitimacy of their, their Jewish state. And it's a very sensitive matter. But when I'm singing a song or I'm calling Yama, Yama, father, I'm talking to my father, and they're hearing this in this constellation, it brings them the emotional side of things, and it's just not the same debate anymore. And they get emotional with the song, they totally identify with the feeling and they and the negativity or the antagonism against the the, 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 the idea or against that narrative being shared is vanishes. It brings the human side of it and not just the intellectual side. We should listen to everyone's traumas via music and then allow ourselves to be to be affected and be involved, to be included. We should radically include ourselves into other people's music and then become our music. So cultural appropriation via music then becomes the right thing to do. <laughs> um, I, I would say it's even a step, I'm, I'm, I'm very um, ambitious that it would be even a step higher where you're talking about uh, our ability to be able to listen to other people's narratives. I want to have the ability to know that other people have other narratives and other traumas and to know it already. And to live, and, and to live knowing it and therefore have empathy from zero. And not after I hear the song or after I hear your narrative, I'll have empathy with you. 
I want us to know for a fact that every human being on this planet has their own trauma and their own story, and therefore I should have empathy because they're the same. <laughs> this is where I want to get. <laughs> When you are standing among a group of people watching something and somebody behind you can't see because they are short, what is your first instinct? To let them in the front, of course. If you see a parent struggle with a baby stroller trying to get on a bus or a train, what is your first instinct? To help. If you see somebody in a wheelchair trying to get onto a step and failing at that, what's your first instinct? To go and help. It is this immediate empathy that's coming from you, that is fascinating, that you are including the short person, the parent who's struggling, the person in a wheelchair, into the group in which everybody can get onto the bus, see the performance, or get onto the pavement. And that is what is needed now. Because the world is full of discriminations, and we need to use our empathy machines to reach out and include. But often, discriminated people are being pushed down in the society, in which it can be dangerous to say that you are discriminated. And this is why so important are the moments in history when these stories and narratives come to the fore. I mean, the AIDS epidemics in the 1980s allowed queer people to come out and share their narratives of being pushed out of the society. The Me Too movement triggered women come to the fore and tell the society publicly about the amount of harassment that is happening. And the same thing is happening now with the Black Lives Matter movement. People who do not belong to the ethnically dominant part of the society, who are of different color, they tell their stories of being discriminated. But because it's so difficult to do, this is why radical inclusion, active engagement, is important. We need to go and actively search the cues for need to include. And then our empathy machines inside is going to do the job. In the same way, we need to tell our stories. We need to provide these narratives, to provide the cues to others so that radical inclusion works both ways. It is a collective act. And this is why it's so important that we focus on it, we engage with it. Putting yourself in other people's shoes, that's a, that's a, that's a great privilege for self-therapy even. And as an actress, I, I, I actually took that exercise to the extreme a lot of times. For example, there was well, one uh, theater piece that I participated in, which was built on improvisations by the actors themselves. So it was like we brought the material, we brought the characters, we even wrote a lot of our, our own monologues and, and, and scenes and, and improvised around them, and that's how the play was built. And one of the characters that I chose to do was a woman settler, a Jewish settler who has lost a child. Uh, a, a Palestinian terrorist has gone into her house and killed her four-year-old kid. So I chose, I chose, it was a choice to put myself in that woman's like seemingly opposite opinion, opposite position of myself. Seemingly I'm against the settlers, right? They're, they're occupying Palestinian uh, lands and I don't identify with them nor their pain because they, they, they're wrong to be there, right? But I chose, that was a good exercise for me to do. And I said, okay, I'm going to do this woman and I'm going to write a monologue where, oh, and it was the year where they uh, evacuated a lot of uh, settlements <clears throat> from the Gaza Strip. 
and uh, it shows that she's in that Gaza Strip and she's being uh, evacuated from the settlement and she refuses to be evacuated. And the monologue was how she's saying that she had buried a child here and she's not going to leave this place because this place is, is she, she, part of her is buried here. And I was so passionate in that in that monologue and I'm wearing, you know, a, a very Jewish religious woman's clothes and I'm like crying and Ithama, the boy is buried here and, and I was fighting physically with this, you know, with the, with the people who are evacuating me and, and people after the show said, how, how, we always, always had panels to talk to the audience after because we had suggested a lot of difficult stuff in that place so we always had these conversations and people were like mesmerized, how could you, a Palestinian woman, put yourself in that very convincing monologue of that person who is seemingly the opposite of you? And I told them, if you translate that monologue to Arabic, that same monologue to Arabic, and put a, 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 an Arabic name in front, instead of the Jewish name of the boy, this is a monologue of a Palestinian woman not wanting to leave her house in 48. Okay, it's the same. And when I saw it like that, when I saw the human element in it, I stopped thinking of settlers the same way that I did. It's not that I'm now with their cause. I am not, uh, I don't accept the reality of settlement, settlements on Palestinian land, but I see the human element. I see the many elements that got them there, the many justifications from the system and from ancestors and from education and from many, many, many elements that gave them justification to do these things. And that made it a human interaction that today I can actually have conversations with people like that. And I don't refuse to do it because I want to have that conversation. I want to understand the elements that brought them there. And I want to see if there is an opening for them to hear also my story and the way I see it, the way I feel about their existence on these settlements. And that's a privilege for me as an actress to be able to put myself in that place, like completely, completely identify with that place as a human being, as a mother who has lost a child. I wish I could bring people, like this is what I would have wished to do to people in the audience. Like grab them, put them in the other person's shoe and let them feel something there. And then get them back into their own shoes, go on with your lives, but with this different mm, perspective of I did not, I never, I never knew that, or that was something that I never heard, or I never thought about it that way. Mm. And they can do with it whatever they want, but that's like, that's the thing that I actually physically would have wanted to do. <laughs> You're amazing. Oh, oh, go on. <laughs> this was lovely to see you. <laughs> the proper term is uh, in Arabic, can hello in Lutaina. Repeat? Can hello in Lutaina. Can hello in Lutaina. Thank you, my dear. If we open our eyes and allow ourselves to see and perceive the hurt of others, our natural built-in empathy machines, our inclusion automaton inside us will do the job. All of us carry the pain of exclusion from the past. Sometimes this is something that happened to us. Oftentimes this is a historical trauma that we learned from our parents. We can use these as tools. Something that allows us to focus on the house that is burning now. You, I, every human being has an urge to belong. And it can be very tempting to affirm our group membership by excluding others. What we learned from Mira today is that radical inclusion is the solution in which we actively engage both rationally and emotionally with the narratives of those who are excluded. Mm -hmm.